Today's gospel verses start a few lines after the heading. Each section of a, of a verse has a heading. The heading for this one is judging others. Those first couple of verses were the completion of last week's gospel. And I think it's worth reading them again today to understand what is going on this week. So the last two lines last week where Jesus said, Stop judging, you will not be judged. Stop condemning, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and gifts will be given to you. A good measure, packed together, shaken down, and overflowing will be poured into your lap. For the measure with which you measure will in return be measured out to you. We have asked for this. Every day we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. God is telling us not to judge. And that is a good thing for two reasons. The first reason that is that we are all terrible judges. The second reason is that God will be the judge. He will judge all of us. And this is good because God knows our hearts. God knows us better than we know ourselves. We should all believe that God is merciful. If not, who among us is worthy of eternal salvation? God is merciful, and he will shower us with mercy. But maybe in a sense of fairness, he is going to shade his judgment based on how we have judged others, how we have measured others, how we have shown mercy. The implication, the implication, implication is that if what we have done is fair in our minds, then we wouldn't mind it if that is how we are judged. Hopefully you are all thinking what I am thinking. I do not want to be judged the way I have judged others. Jesus tells us two parables today. Both are very comical. We see Jesus' sense of humor. The first one is about the blind leading the blind. Have you ever seen a blind man leading another blind man? Of course not. The idea is comical. Imagine where they would go. Imagine what trouble they would get into. And how much, imagine how much they would get hurt. I think of Mr. Magoo, if you remember Mr. Magoo. Each one is blindly trusting the other one to lead him around. They think they are safe. They think they are being led in the right direction. But it's just a matter of time before they fall into a ditch. I guess this could happen. A blind man could be standing at the crosswalk of a busy intersection. Another blind man walks up beside the first and says, help across the street. The first blind man, thinking that the second man was offering help, not asking for it, says, sure. And together, arm in arm, they step off the curb and into traffic. You know what will happen. Cars screeching to a stop, onlookers screaming warnings. Let's pretend that they make it safely across. They both say at the same time, thanks, each wondering why the other was thanking him. This is the way it is when you are spiritually blind and trying to lead someone else. You might think that this verse means we should make sure we are not following blind guides, and it is. But it is also telling us that we should make sure that we are not blind guides. Let's ask ourselves, are we spiritually blind? Jesus is calling us to be leaders. He's calling us to be disciples. We should take this call with responsibility. We must prepare ourselves for this task. If we ourselves are blind, we cannot lead others who are blind. Blindness is a symbol for those who are in darkness, those who do not have faith. Disciples are able to share the light of faith by becoming better formed in their own faith. Disciples must become teachers of the faith. Jesus says that we must aspire to be like the teacher, like Jesus, although we will never be greater than the teacher. Just like a blind person cannot lead another blind person, a student cannot lead a teacher. The second parable about the man with a wooden beam in, the eye, in his eye. Imagine it, a beam. Not a sliver, not a speck, not a small stick, but a big 20-foot beam. I have seen pictorial views of this, a man with a large beam sticking out of his eye socket. 
He could probably only see splinters out of this eye. He does not manage to think that he sees a, He does manage to think that he sees a splinter in his brother's eye. Jesus asked, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove that splinter in your eye? Jesus calls this man a hypocrite. Isn't that what, would we, what we would be, hypocrites? Noticing the weaknesses or problems in others, but not noticing the weakness in our own lives. Jesus says to remove the beam first from your own eye, then you will be able to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. Let me give you an example. I was driving down Cooper Road when I saw a person on a small scooter, you know, those little tiny scooters in the side street and realized that he was going to make the turn and pull in front of me. I started to say, myself, say to myself, look at this idiot. He doesn't know how to drive. But then I noticed it was a friend of mine. <laughs> I slowed up to give him plenty of room. He never noticed that it was me. But if it wasn't my friend, I probably would still be talking about how crazy this driver was. And imagine if I was on a scooter, I would expect everybody to stop and let me go. Here comes Bob. I started judging, then I changed my judgment, then I changed my outlook. We are all given to noting the defects of others more readily, readily than our own. We judge our neighbors while not recognizing our own faults. One way to combat this is to pray for humility, to pray for gentleness in dealing with others. When Jesus said, let the one without sin cast the first stone, what happened? Maybe we should remember this when we are ready to throw stones, to throw judgments. Jesus cautions us to correct our own weaknesses and faults before we can effectively help someone else. When I change, the whole world changes. We are terrible judges, but even if we were not terrible judges, would it make any difference? Would anything change? Though Jesus spoke in terms of good tree, bad tree, good person, evil person, in reality, every human person is a work in progress. At any time, a person is a mixture of good and evil. A person is both redeemed and unredeemed. Jesus does not want disciples who do good things. Like the good tree, Jesus wants disciples who are good who have acknowledged their faults and have worked on them through time and effort and prayer. To become truly holy people of faith, the good tree always bears good fruit. In the next section, Jesus says, the gospel coming up, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I command? Because Lord, I am redeemed and I am unredeemed. A good tree bears good fruit. Every tree is known by its own fruit. A good person out of goodness in his heart produces good. An evil person out of evil produces evil. For from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. <laughs>